All right. Uh, state of mind. How you doing? I'm very excited today because uh, AJ Mendes <laughs> is here and she's the bomb. If you like what you see, hit that thing right here, that little cube that says subscribe. Okay, got rid of that. Um, and why do we love AJ Mendes? I'll tell you why. She was a WWE or in the WWE. Uh, she's a mental health advocate. She's a New York Times bestselling author. Crazy is my superpower. And it's my superpower. Uh, she's Spanish. And she's bipolar. Yeah. So we're, she's my sister and I'm her brother. Um, listen, today on State of Mind, this is, State of Mind is kind of like, let's say, um, you and your husband invited Sonny over for dinner. <laughs> oh my God. And you guys just started getting to know each other. That's what this is about. Okay. okay. Um, how you doing? I'm good. I'm so I'm so excited to be here. I, I we talked about it a little, yes. but I feel like it's important to recap okay. that we've technically met before. Yes. But I am such a big fan of General Hospital and of yourself and your advocacy that I shook your hand and I ran away I immediately. Think, I, I do remember so, you did, yeah. <laughs> but I thought it was very cute. Oh my god! I just it, I just was like. I can't. Like, I just had no words. So I was like, let me just get in and out. And I literally ran and then I went into another room. And this was like at a NAMI commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and one of the, the kind people who was organizing it was like, go back in there. And I was like, I can't. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, so it's nice to uh, be seated and yeah. have a conversation with you. Uh, hey, it's, it's fantastic that you're here. Really. Where you, uh, are you from? I'm from New Jersey. Oh, you are. Yes. <laughs> oh, people like me in New Jersey. <laughs> yes. In yes, LA, they're like, uh, who, who, who? Sonny what? <laughs> when in New York, it's like, hey, Sonny! Hey! Yep. So how was New Jersey? <sighs> um, I feel like my opinion of it is colored in all of the trauma that happened there. So it is... It, I, oh, I would say I, I survived New Jersey. What, what, like what? You, it was tough uh, with what? Like mental illness or money or? Yeah, a little bit of everything. The majority of my mental health struggles before I got a diagnosis, all of that happened in New Jersey um, from, you know, from birth to, I think I got my diagnosis when I was around the age of 20. Um, Me too. Really? Yeah, I was 22. Really? Not 22, 22. Okay. And when, just quick question. Yeah. You, when your onset of symptoms, do you like recall when that started? That's a, you, you know what's amazing? I can't believe we're, we're going straight here. And I, I know. And I love it. And I love it. Because <laughs> that's what happens here. I think I'm going to do this. And then it goes to this. Mm -hmm. um, I did a, a, a very, probably one of the deepest interviews. And, and, and I'm going to get very emotional. Right now, I don't. I, I, I know. I knew I was going to get emotional. I say that all the time, but with you, I think I am a lot. And I'm emotional talking about this interview because it's the deepest interview I've ever done. And I started talking about suicide, and and not just talking about suicide because I feel I don't know about you, that I'm open with all this because if other people see that I'm open, they're all right with being open. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I was afraid of was suicide, but because last year during the pandemic, that's where I was. And I decided to really talk about it. And you know what? I know it's going to help people and it helps me because it, 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 it's not so hard to talk about for me now. Right. You get me? Yeah. So we talked about early when I first, look, when I was a kid, I had abuse. Um, some other things that I, I'm not going to get into, but um, I didn't know. Nobody knew, uh, mm -hmm. you know, about manic depression or bipolar. But I think as a teenager, I I used to fight a lot. 
Mm. I probably could beat you up when I was <laughs> when I was in the, when I was in high school. I was all big and stuff. And we used to get in fights, and I'd fight all the time. And I was the leader, and I'd say, "Let's go, man! Come on, we gotta get it." And then a lot, a couple times, I couldn't do it. I was scared. Really? I was terrified, man. Like really scared, like a little boy who came. And I'd say to them, "No, can't go, man." They go, "Come on, why?" I said, "No, because it's not a good idea right now." They go, "All right," but I could. I was maybe that was the beginning. Ooh, How about you? What, did you have anything in the beginning that made you feel? Yeah. I, not you're interviewing me, which is good. but <laughs> Well, I just find it so fascinating because everyone has a different story and a, yeah. and a journey and how they got there. And I, I, I think onset of symptoms for most people, on average, it takes 10 years from the onset to a proper diagnosis, which is 10 years of questions and not really knowing or wow. just thinking it's... I'm I'm anxious or I'm violent or I'm you know um, yeah, yeah impulsive yeah um, and and so it was kind of similar for me I would I would say maybe ten ten years before my my diagnosis I I I mean I guess as far back as I can remember I had like very very severe anxiety and like stomach aches and social anxiety and like agoraphobia and what's agoraphobia just being afraid of being like in public oh, with like a lot oh. of people. Um, like it would be hard for me to like leave the house and um and and I kind of thought it was like the situations we were in my my family and I were homeless for most of my oh. childhood yeah like I, I think we probably moved 20 times because we were always getting evicted and and then having to like squat in an empty building or a stranger would take us in and we'd like sleep in their garage or on their porch. Wow. And, For how long? How many till you were what? Gosh. Um, I did most of my childhood. I don't remember not being homeless until I moved out and went to, went to college for a very short period of time. <laughs> wow. Now, when you had a nervous breakdown, yeah, like I had one at 22 and I was in a mental institution, did you go to a mental institution or did you just have to, did you go through it at home? Or? You no, know, so this was, um, it's it sort of, I look back and I'm like, whoa, the system failed me. Um, I overdosed and um it, it was my first um suicide attempt and it, i was released from the hospital they asked me there was like a list of like three or four questions which is like the are you safe to release kind of yeah, questionnaire yeah. and i just lied it, like staring at them i was like it was an accident and and I had like these track marks because I had to, Damn. you know, they because like I had to get, um, I was like poked and prodded for so long because of the, all the stuff they were pumping through my system yeah. to try to get all the uh, medication. Now, on my before system. the suicide, su before you have those thoughts, because I think of myself, I didn't have anxiety when I was young. I've had it later. I just had major breakdown the first one and terrible. But anxiety never came. Depression happened. But what is anxiety like? especially at that time for you, it, was it painful like mine? It's so, you don't want to, you can't live in it, man. Yeah. But you do. Mm -hmm. And we can, look at us, right? Yeah. We're here. But in that kind of anxiety, your mind starts going, you know, did you ever shake? Yeah. What? Yeah. I did for the first time last year. Really? Yeah. I like, a, and I said, Paula, my wife, what, what the fuck is this? She goes, honey, it's all right. And then I just found that you tell me, I just found out I'm excited like a little boy with you. It's freaking great. <laughs> but I just found out this guy at the supermarket told me that's a good thing that you're shaking because it lets out everything. Ooh. But I was like, I'm doing myself in because I can't live like this, man. Wow. So you 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 were shaking too. I would get um, like panic attacks where yeah. like I would hyperventilate yeah. and shake and yeah. um, I would like kind of wake up in the middle of the night and get a panic attack. And that was always so weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. In the middle of the night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I remember like, I think my first one was when we were living in a motel. It was like a monthly rate motel. And it was, the room was just so small, something that like triggered my first panic attack. Yeah. And I remember I had to like be polite and have it quietly because <laughs> uh, it was five people and a dog in like these oh, two beds yeah. in a little room. So I was like, okay, hyperventilate real quietly and be polite about it. Yeah. So I, there was never like time to like assess what I was feeling or 
I would think it was like the situation and I didn't think it was my mental health. I just thought like, oh, I'm freaking out because this sucks. Life sucks yeah. right now. Yeah. Um, but it took me almost dying to go, oh, I should get a diagnosis. Well, then you got a diagnosis. Yeah. Then what? Like I've been taking lithium for 30 years mm. and I've had, I haven't had a, another breakdown in 30 years. Wow. So manic episodes don't scare me because it's been so long that I'm like, hey, that, that ain't happening again. Anxiety scares the fuck out of me. I got to be honest. Really? Yo, the fucking man. And you're bipolar one or two? two uh, bipolar one. One, because you're, you have mania, not hypomania. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And I've been hospitalized, you know, so yeah. that's... Um, Although, you know, the manic episodes are horrible because mm -hmm. then you got to have the depression that yeah. goes with it. But the anxiety is my Freddy Krueger. I call him Freddy Krueger. Why is that? Well, because he's always fucking with me like at night. <laughs> and when <laughs> and you don't, don't know where he's going to pop out. <laughs> and then I wake up in the middle of the night and, hey, and I'm like, no, dude, you ain't getting me. And most of the time I can beat him. But this one... This anxiety lasted four months. Wow. 24-7. Wow. 24-7. Even sleeping. Were you in, were you an insomniac during that time? Uh, or it just would wake you up? I couldn't. I didn't want to sleep because it would I, it would wake me up and I'd be screwed up. <sighs> so it was just, you know, I did sleep, but not really. Mm. So for four months, I went through it. And it was the, you know, during the pandemic. Yeah. And then I finally found a psychiatrist. It was hard to get a psychiatrist during that time. And he, and he was a little off, but I liked him because he went through what I went through. So he'd be like, okay, we're going to put the, and I'm like, is this guy for real? But guess what? He gave me Lexapro mm. and it saved my life. Really? Just like lithium saved my life. Lexapro saved my life. And I, I, and then I got off about eight months later. Oh wow! And now I feel like just the best. Oh wow! And I got AJ Mendes on the couch. <laughs> no, but but yeah, it was, it was tough. It was tough. So once you were diagnosed, you were good for. You didn't have another. No, well I haven't written about it. Mm. <laughs> but um, for me, I I. I mean, we're bipolar, so like we can be two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Um, but I am both a, a supremely private person and weirdly oh. like an open book. Yeah. But I'm an open book about my mental health because I think that it can be useful. Yes. And like like you were saying, like when we talk about it, it gives other people permission to talk about it, feel a little bit more comfortable and not like we have to like whisper about it. Right. right. Um and so like that feels like a piece of myself I'm willing to give up. But uh, like everything else, I'm like not, you know, yeah. I'm very, very protective of, of pieces of my life. And I really need to feel like I've processed something and like have a perspective in which I can give like wisdom or yeah, like something yeah. that people can use instead yeah. of just like, I don't know. So I don't talk about stuff when I'm going through it. Um, so, but there were like more recent uh it, scary situations like yeah. the past like maybe like 10 years that I it's healing isn't linear or you know mental health journeys aren't linear so yeah. there's always like setbacks um I know which is so frustrating <laughs> but but you know I feel like every time you get through it it's just it's like winning a war you're just that's so much right more skilled afterwards and that, tougher and that's right that's the that's the thing look look and you're absolutely right in that like the reason they asked me today in this interview, why didn't you end your life or whatever? And I had, there was a few, there was a few things that happened, especially at one point when it was, I, th I prayed to God, thought of my family, and I thought of, I did think a state of mind, I gotta be honest, of, of if I did that, what message am I sending? Right. And the reality is, if I had done that, look what's happened in a year. Right. It's it's unreal. Mm -hmm. So you are rewarded. God gives you a, a huge gift. Yeah. And he doesn't usually give you 
what you can't handle. But the reality is sometimes the devil gets involved. That's the way I see things. Because my whole, I've had three nervous breakdowns. It's the devil, I say, and God fighting. Mm -hmm. Most of the time God wins. But there are times when the devil wins and you're not there anymore, right? Oh, my God. Can we, what the hell is this interview? I read about that in your book. I loved your book, by oh, the way. thank you. Damn. Nothing general about and it. <laughs> Put a little graphic on it. Yeah. Uh, it was really great. And I think that uh, what I especially liked about it was the way that you sort of matter-of-factly talk about your mental health and, and the, the breakdowns in particular. Because I think when you, you don't treat it with kid gloves and when you don't... Treat it, treat it like it's like oh it's a very special episode like yeah so when it's no. just like hey this is the thing that happened it makes it such a more approachable understandable less intimidating conversation um so i really loved the way that you did that it, so okay so i i named my depression because it's important for me to separate it from myself and for it not to be like this ominous thing um i was just named it my middle name so it's jeanette <laughs> um, and those those are my dark days when Jeanette takes over and she's the one that has like the bad ideas and um, and so that's the easier way for me to know it's not me it's just a little piece of me yeah um, but I didn't know that and, uh, when I was 19 or, or 20 when I um, uh, had overdosed and, and had my, my first um, the suicide attempt when I became a suicide survivor for the first time um, I didn't know. I just thought it was just my brain very matter of factly saying there's a pain and we need to stop it. And that was terrifying to me, not understanding what was happening, but just like, oh, well, this is the solution. Um, and then when you survive something like that, uh, for me personally, and I don't know if it's like everybody, but for me, the scary thing is how it almost becomes... Uh, it stays with you. It's like always an option. You, like your darkness will always tell you it's an option. Um, and so that's something you have to like fight constantly. Yeah. And so the next time something got, got scary and got to that, that point, I was having really bad suicidal ideation. Um, I didn't go through with the attempt. However, I did... Um, book a hotel room to to die in wow because i didn't i didn't want my husband to um find me you know i didn't want him to have to wow. deal with that so i was just thinking very matter of factly and thinking, no one knew nobody knew um and this is actually why i became a, a mental health advocate and why i decided to to write the book and and write about this and this i haven't talked about yet um but uh I, from the outside, would have seemed like I had everything in the whole world. I was on TV, and I'm a champion, like, and I'm, you know, dream career, got married, like, perfect, wonderful year. But a lot of times with bipolar disorder, big life changes yeah. kind of th throw you off. Yeah. Um, and you, if it's a high, you're going to hit a low. Yeah. Um, and so in the same year of my life I, I like moved to a different state I got married I um, got really sick and I had to have uh, I had to take time off work for surgeries actually um, d during one of the breaks I had you, you know how this is because general hospital is no time off no with time shooting. Off. that's right. kind of what wrestling is it's no off season yeah. just shoot 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 um, so the only time I ever got time off was for <laughs> surgery. And so me and my husband were like, let's just sneak a wedding in here. <laughs> and that's how we got married. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so it was this very, like, everything was happening really fast. And it was just like a, a chaos and a tornado of highs and lows in life. But I was really sick and I was scared. I had, I had to have multiple surgeries. Um, and so all this stuff is happening. And then I got hurt uh, in the ring. And then my husband got sued <laughs> and, then, and it was just all this. And then I, you know, there was stuff in my family. And so it was all this stuff happening like the same year. And so career's like great and everything's going great. And I have my husband and, but it was my bipolar disorder couldn't handle it. Yes. 
Yes, that's the way it works. It, it was it was too much for me, and I wasn't taking care of myself the way I should have. Yes, been. I wasn't in therapy consistently. I was playing fast and loose with my medication. Oh boy. Yeah, because I was being really vain about it because I I gain weight when I'm on my medication, and uh, so I was like, you know, oh, I'm on TV. I can't. I'd rather I, be alive. Than I know. Be, I know. Right. Than have a six pack. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, and so so I. So during this chaos, I, the only solution to me, the only uh, thing I could do was just, um, just, I booked a hotel room and I, that was my plan. And um, so I, at some point realized, okay, this isn't my brain. It's the darkness talking. Yeah. Um, And I called the suicide prevention hotline. And the tricky thing about that is my phone number was out of the area code. And you have to, they have to route your number by area code so they can send emergency services if they need to. And so once they found out I wasn't where my area code was, um, they were like, you have to call this number. This is the, your local one. You have to do this. Please promise you will call this number. Write this number down. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. Didn't write it down. Just hung up. And I was like, that's the sign I'm supposed to do this. So I went back. To oh, it. Oh man. And then something else was like, no, 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 try again, try again. And I was like, I don't have the number. I don't have the number. Maybe I should call 311 and ask them for the number. <laughs> so, so I called the first of all, only I would have the hilarious suicide attempt. Like where it just goes wrong and somebody's <laughs> like, you have the wrong number when you call right. suicide prevention. <laughs> um, only me. But so I'm like, okay, 311 might help me get the right number. Um, and the man on the other end of the phone, this man was so patient and so kind. Oh, wow. And I don't even understand what happened, but I just started telling him everything. Wow. <laughs> this kind stranger who gets like noise complaints. Yes. This is not his job. Yes. And I didn't realize that it was the first time in a long, long time someone had shown me kindness and was just like, oh, that sucks. Like for so long, people just thought I was like on the top of the world and I'm the caretaker in my family and what I I was providing for everybody. But there wasn't anybody anybody checking in on me. Mm -hmm. And so it was just I didn't realize I just, just needed somebody to check in on me. Yeah. And it was this tiny small act of kindness that literally saved my life like I don't know his name I don't like I just remember his voice I can hear his voice right now it was just kind and patient and he just listened and and that was enough for me to go okay I need to go home like this is terrifying um and so that I just thought like I could handle it on my own and and so what I realized from that (laughs) was that I needed to talk about my diagnosis Mm -hmm. because a huge problem was I was hiding it. Like the world didn't know at the time that I was bipolar. I never talked about my mental health. Um, So I needed to like come out of hiding. And your culture adds to that, doesn't it? Oh my gosh, there's so many, uh, there's so much stigma in the the Latinx community. Um, But habla español. Uh, very, very poorly. <laughs> no, it's one of those things where like you kind of I kind of feel like I'm in in the middle of two cultures, you yeah. know, like I'm not brown enough for Puerto Ricans yeah. and I'm not uh, I'm too brown for white people. Like it's it's, yeah. it's none of the fun in all of the ways. And racism. I'm Italian, <laughs> but I'm, I'm full blooded Spanish, but I'm Italian. Yeah, because I've been playing Italian. <laughs> Exactly. I think I, I think people thought it was like Asian for a really long time. Right. Um, but yeah. So so so. It, I mean, there's I, there, I can go through a whole down a whole wormhole. But that's the greatest. You know why that's a great story? Just as you were saying it, and the way you did it, it's like a, like a cool monologue. <laughs> if you were you know acting, um, because now people can see that those calls that you make suicide prevention things they save your life man yeah don't act like don't think that it's like oh i'm gonna call that's a that's a 
Yeah. And if you don't, you don't have to call 311. You can call 1 800 273 8255. That's right. a suicide prevention line. Exactly. <laughs> or text 741 741. Um, that's the crisis text line. Um, but it really it does make such a difference just to have somebody to reach out to. And that's what started my journey of becoming an advocate was because I realized that if somebody just being kind was enough to um, save my life, <laughs> then what would it what kind of power could could I have if I could say, hey, I went through this, I survived and I can thrive like I have a, a successful career and I've gone on to do like three more careers that were my dream careers after wrestling um and none of that would have happened if i let the darkness right. take me if right I just suffered in silence so that's why i'm very loud about it now and i'm such an open book and i'm i'll never shut up about my mental health now because somebody needs to hear it somebody yes. just needs like a second of kindness because it might save their life yes um, but I also think that that's one of those things where it's like you really never know what somebody's going through because everyone would have thought I was like the happiest person in the world. And and so they never checked. They never wondered. Yeah. Um, but you just never know. So give people a little bit of grace and you never know where a little bit of kindness could change somebody's life. That's a beautiful. I love that story, man. Um, so let's talk about. I want, I'm interested in how was wrestling? I loved it. I loved it. You're like one of the <laughs> luck to, to be small like you are, pretty like you are. That's a lucky break, no? Yeah. I mean, for for especially when I started, it was the like prototype was like Pamela Anderson. Like that oh. was like what the women looked like. Or, are you familiar with China? Yeah, yeah. It was like, you had to be like an Amazon woman. Yeah, that was or huge. Sex yeah. pot. And I'm neither. So, so uh, and then I also paid to try out, which is like such a gimmick. But, um, oh, you did? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it worked. I got hired. Um, and I, I don't think it was supposed to, I don't think I was supposed to succeed. I think I was, you know, good in the ring and I was supposed to train other girls that were like way hotter to like go yeah. to TV. Yeah. Um, and then I just got like really lucky where we did. Uh, th I got popular with the fans. And so, how did you? What did you do in the audition that was so good? <laughs> I talked a lot of shit. Oh, you did? <laughs> like, hey, motherfucker! <laughs> that is my specialty. Was was just I. I oh, you're a shit talker. I'm a shit talker. Yeah. <laughs> and then they said, "I want her." Improv. Yeah, it was the first day they like called me into the, the there was like three rings and three rooms and we were running spots and I could like run a spot like I'm fine in the ring. But they called me into one of the rooms. And they were like cut a promo. And I was like, I thought we were doing that on Wednesday. And they're like cut a promo right now on the spot. You just had to make it up. And I didn't have anything planned. And so I was just like I went into a heel character, which is like the bad guy character. And I was just a dick and it worked. <laughs> <laughs> like. <laughs> I just that's my natural instinct and it worked and and yeah and, and and so that was kind of what it was got me over with the fans was I looked like them is the first time they could see themselves represented on screen just like I was like an average chick and I was like a fan could make it into the ring um and that like connected us wow and and that's like where how I'm, long did you do that how long did you wrestle oh gosh maybe a decade are you um, serious? Yeah, of my life, like between the independence and then on television, yeah. Because there's like an independent circuit where you wrestle oh, for like oh. 20 bucks. Yeah, and, yeah, like, yeah. Food, I'm like, that's it. Damn, you were there <laughs> for 10? Yeah. You see, I was one of those guys, you know, look, I finally got respect for uh, WWE, but in the beginning when I was young, I was like, oh, come on, that's not real, and they're just acting. And then somebody said to me, dude, you don't understand. And I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, these, these, they're athletes, man. And they get hurt. And then I started watching with a different eye. And I started seeing blood is blood, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm thinking, that's not real blood, right? And they're like, no, dude, that's real blood. And I see people's head coming. <laughs> it's tough stuff. It is. I always say it's like, do you, you can... If, even if I know a punch is coming, it's still a punch. Like, it still hurts. Maybe it hurts more because I know it's coming, you know, and I, like, I'm afraid of it. 
<laughs> but um, I would say it's like it's like the Avengers meets Saturday Night Live. Like there's improv. Like there's yeah. a lot that right. you have to call on the fly because you're surrounded. And that's like the exciting part is like you're surrounded by all these people. They can see you talk to each other so you can't talk to each other um and sometimes shit doesn't work in front of the crowd they're bored and you have to like oh how do we get them well wow. scrap our plan and let's just you know make something up so <laughs> now you're right are you writing movies and stuff what's happening with you yes or is that hush hush too no no well one of them is but um so let's let's end this on you writing <laughs> movies so so i will say because you're gonna put me in your movie <laughs> Oh my God! I would, uh. I would die. Yes, please. Um, I would say the connective tissue is in wrestling. I got the, to the experience of being the art and being the thing that's on camera, um, but what and being the face of the mission. But what I realized is that I want to focus on being the artist, and the mission continues without just me being the character. I wanted to create characters in all different mediums for the next generation. I didn't see myself on TV growing up and I had to literally put myself on TV to yeah. see a brown girl in wrestling, to see a brown girl that looked like me be a superhero. Um, I had to become it. So I don't want other people to have to do that. I want to keep making those characters. Right. Um, and so after wrestling, I got into writing. I wrote the book. I realized that um, what I went to school for a very brief period of time was film and television production writing. I went to NYU, Tisch School of the Arts and couldn't afford it and had to leave. Um, but I took the circuitous route and eventually got there because um, this past year, got hired to write my first feature. It's going to be on Netflix. I'm so excited. What <laughs> <Yeah>. the heck? <laughs> um, and then we just got our, an offer for our second feature. Oh, no. <laughs> that one's not out yet, but I can say that we get an offer. I'm very excited. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah. And then we're developing. Um, my, my writing partner and I decided to like make this production company to have our hands in like every piece of the process. And so now, you know, we're getting hired to write other people's projects and work for different studios, but we're also developing our own projects. So we're developing a couple of TV shows as well right now. And that's what I went to school for. It's what I dreamt of and, and creating these worlds of like, that was how I survived when I was homeless and didn't know any way to cope with my situation. Yeah. I would escape to the to fantasy and like write stories in my head or draw comic books in like a cheap little notebook. Just anything to escape, be anywhere but here. Wow. And to now have made have transitioned from that just being this thing that saved my life to thing I can make a career out of is uh, a a dream. <laughs> well, see, that's why if you're if you have mental illness. And you and I are bipolar and among everything else, probably depression, anxiety. When you go through what we've been through, this is what happens. Mm -hmm. When you go through the tunnel of darkness, you get to the light and, and this, is, this is it. This is what happens. You and I can be here talking about all that stuff. People are going to watch and go, you know what, if they can do it, I think I can do it. And that's the main thing. Mm -hmm. All right, AJ, this has been an incredible interview. It didn't even, it's not even an interview. It was just, just us talking about some really important stuff and, and having fun doing it. So I wanna say thank you and uh, when you write your second book, whatever the hell else you're doing, come back. And we'll do it again, and you, we'll sell we'll sell it here. You know. I would love that. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> All right, AJ. Thank. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was so good, man. <laughs> All right. Thank you.